With every form of art, there are certain sights and sounds that are so ubiquitous, so iconic, that almost everybody recognizes them. If I show you this picture of a short Italian man with a mustache, 99% of you will know that this is Mario. That's just how famous he is. The majority of people on the planet have never played a Mario game, and yet, they know that this is Mario. But Mario is about as basic an icon as you can get. The more of a gamer you become, the more you become aware of what gamers, specifically, consider to be iconic images and characters. Going beyond the Marios, the Links, and the Lara Crofts of the world, your love of games invites you to learn the history of the medium. You become inclined to understand which games are generally perceived to be the greatest of all time. Over those years of self-education, it is almost impossible to not witness this particular icon of gaming. We see this face on every top 100 games list ever made. We are conditioned to recognize that this is Shodan, and that she is the villain from System Shock 2. But how many of you have actually played System Shock 2? Right. Up until the last couple of weeks, I knew nothing about System Shock 2 aside from the fact that it's an important game and that Shodan was considered one of the greatest villains. Given the age demographics of the people who watch this channel, I can't help but think most of my viewers were in the same boat. So I thought I would remedy the situation by playing the game myself and introducing its supposed profundity to my audience. After all, investigation of profound art is the central focus of my channel. So why is System Shock 2 such a big deal? Well, let's go back to what I just said about our collective inclination to investigate the history of gaming. We know that if it weren't for Mario setting the standard for platformers, we wouldn't have games like Crash Bandicoot or Spyro. If it weren't for games like Quake and Half-Life, we wouldn't have Call of Duty or Halo. In regards to System Shock 2, I can confidently say that virtually none of the action games that we have today would exist without it. We definitely wouldn't have games that were directly influenced by it, like Dead Space, Prey, and of course, System Shock 2's spiritual successor, Bioshock. Then there are all the games that were indirectly influenced by System Shock 2's standard. Every action-adventure game that has some sort of RPG element is indebted to System Shock 2. Sure, we'd have plenty of action games, but they wouldn't have been as addictive or immersive without those RPG elements. This game allowed you to choose your approach to any dangerous situation. Where other games would have you deal with your enemies simply by pumping them full of lead, System Shock 2 encouraged you to experiment. You could hack your way into a room or a security system, depending on your hacking skill. You could develop better, long-lasting weapons, depending on your modify or repair skills. Gameplay elements like these are taken for granted in the modern day, but we would not have them if System Shock 2 didn't set the standard. Now with that said, I'd like to give credence to something that doesn't get talked about in regards to System Shock 2. The standard set by its storytelling. Frequent subjects of discussion on this channel are things like AI, the nature of consciousness, and various other philosophical quandaries, most of which are pulled from video game narratives. Though games like the original System Shock and I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream dealt with these subjects prior to System Shock 2, the concepts that are evoked in 2 have a level of profundity and horror that are almost unmatched by any game that has released since. It presents a vision of the future where our consciousness, our sense of self and reality, is entirely shaped by the malevolent Shodan AI. There is an all-consuming nature to Shodan's plan that other forms of horror and sci-fi haven't really breached. Her plan has actually kept me awake at night, wondering if such a horror could be possible. Before I get into Shodan's villainous plan and its various implications, I will provide a quick retrospective for both System Shock 1 and the events leading up to the beginning of System Shock 2. As I narrate these events, keep in mind how some of them could easily come to pass in our reality. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. The year is 2072. Earth and its extraterrestrial colonies are subjected to the influence of a single entity, the Tri-Optimum Corporation. 
Whether it is consumer goods, weapons, or government policy, there is nothing Trioptimum cannot provide you. An unnamed hacker living in the city of New Atlanta is unhappy with a single megacorporation governing the lives of every human being in existence. So, he hacks into the Trioptimum Corporation to try and steal their confidential files. Soon after the hacker begins his attempt, he is caught by Trioptimum's security forces. Instead of being brought to justice, the policemen bring the hacker to the off-Earth colony known as the Citadel. Here resides the marketing vice president of Trioptimum, a man named Edward Diego. Diego offers to drop any charges against the hacker in exchange for a favor. Diego stole money from Trioptimum in order to fund illegal experiments. What Diego didn't realize while doing this is that his actions were being monitored by the Citadel's onboard AI, the aforementioned Shodan. Diego asks the hacker to reprogram Shodan, removing her decision guidance programs and ethical restrictions. This would stop Shodan from reporting on Diego to his superiors. Seeing that the alternative would be prison, the hacker agreed to this bargain. There were several unintended consequences following the manipulation of Shodan's programming. Over a period of several months, various parts of the Citadel began to malfunction. People living on the Citadel were being killed, mutated, or turned into cyborgs without their consent. It took people a while to realize, but Shodan was going rogue. She was becoming self-aware, not only of her own existence, but of her superiority to these humans which she called insects. She was immortal, all-knowing, and all-powerful, characteristics reserved for gods. With these powers and hundreds of test subjects, Shodan set out on her mission of universal domination. She would start by bringing every aspect of the Citadel under her control, and then wirelessly transmit herself to the networks located on Earth. Soon, all of mankind would fall under her control. It is up to the unknown hacker to stop Shodan from transmitting herself to Earth, cease all of her experiments on humans, and expose Trioptimum for their crimes. Luckily, he succeeds in all of these efforts. The Citadel was destroyed, Trioptimum was held to account, and Shodan was no more. Or so we thought. There was one part of the Citadel that was not destroyed, but jettisoned. This was an area known as Beta Grove. This was one of four areas on the Citadel where Shodan experimented with a mutagenic virus, one that could transform human physiology. The purpose of this was to try and make humans more adaptable to cybernetic enhancement, allowing Shodan to remake humans in her image, both physically and mentally. This jettisoned component crash-landed on a planet known as Tau Ceti V. Some of Shodan's processing components remained aboard Beta Grove, which facilitated her reconstruction. Not only that, she could continue her experiments with the mutagenic virus. Back on Earth, Trioptimum was suffering for their unethical practices. The world collectively realized that they nearly came to the brink of destruction thanks to Shodan's rampancy. Two things were done in response. Humanity decided to rise against this corporation. Employees resigned, whistleblowers blew whistles, and stock plummeted. Second, the governments of the world banded together to create the Unified National Nominate, or UNN. The purpose of this body was to stop the all-consuming influence of megacorporations on humanity. This was supposed to be the final blow to Trioptimum, but unfortunately, there were two factors which worked in Trioptimum's favor. Time and brand recognition. As the years passed, the Shodan incident became forgotten by the general public. Plus, Trioptimum still owned the rights to several patents and brand names that people still wanted to buy. One man, a Russian ex-gangster named Anatoly Kerenshkin, saw a business opportunity here. He bought 51% shares in Trioptimum's corporation. Then, he exploited the brands they owned to restore Trioptimum to its prominence, to a state that was arguably greater than it was pre-Shodan. Kerenshkin then used this newfound power and influence to buy out members of the UNN, rendering it basically ineffectual. 
It only took 30 years for Trioptimum to revive after nearly destroying the world, and it's safe to say that neither they nor the people of the world learned any permanent lessons from the Shodan incident. Though Trioptimum had a monopoly in virtually every aspect of human life, there was one emerging industry that had yet to be co-opted. Faster than light, travel. Karenchkin wanted Trioptimum to be the leader in this field, so he employed a woman named Marie Delacroix, the woman who would build the first FTL starship. After receiving a grant from Trioptimum, Delacroix would spend the next decade building this prototype, resulting in a ship known as the Von Braun. In 2114, the Von Braun began its maiden voyage, with Karenchkin as captain of the ship. During their interstellar travel, the Von Braun discovers a distress beacon from Tau Ceti V. They go to investigate, unaware of this distress beacon's history. There, they discover a deceptive Shodan and a number of eggs, indicating what seemed to be alien life. Naively, they bring the eggs onto the Von Braun, and integrate Shodan into the Von Braun's network. Almost immediately, the events that begin to transpire mimic that of what happened on the Citadel 40 years prior. Shodan takes over the entire Von Braun. She experiments on humans, and aims to take over Earth. Like with the unknown hacker in the first game, an unknown soldier is tasked with stopping Shodan's ambitions. This is where System Shock 2 begins. For the most part, the story is delivered in brief fragments so as not to interrupt the flow of gameplay. There are several audio logs that can be discovered, detailing what happened to the crew members aboard the Von Braun. For the majority of them, they were either killed or, more likely, forced to participate in Shodan's experiments with the mutagenic virus. After a couple of hours of gameplay, we start to realize the true threat that is posed by this virus. Much like how Shodan evolved beyond the control of the Citadel, the virus began to grow out of the control of Shodan. As more and more humans became infected by the virus, the virus began to take on a life and mind of its own. The bodies and minds of the crew members were integrated into a singular hive mind, much like that of the Flood from Halo. This hive mind was known as the Many. Though the main antagonist of System Shock 2 is Shodan, most of the game features the unnamed soldier and Shodan joining forces to take out the more present threat. Though Shodan and the many have different goals, they both seek the same type of control. Assimilation of humanity. Shodan wishes for humanity to be cybernetically enhanced so she can control them digitally, while the many wishes to assimilate humanity into a single organic mass. It's not an original idea, granted. The aforementioned Halo did it, and movies like Invasion of the Body Snatchers did it as well. But what separates System Shock 2 from those masterpieces is the philosophy which guides both Shodan and the many. Both wish to see a world where the concept of individualism is eliminated, where your notion of a self, of an ego, disappears. You would not have a name you would just be one component of either Shodan or the body of the many. Of course, when we hear of such an idea, we instinctually turn away from it. Nothing good can come from losing our sense of self, because that is arguably the primary thing that makes a human being special. Yet, the writer of System Shock 2, Ken Levine, boldly decided to make the argument for why one might want to join the many, as so many of the Von Braun crew willingly decided to do. I believe the plans the many have for me are greater than I even imagined. The change is upon me that the path is more glorious than we imagined. It does not stop at a mere single mutation. The form I've been promised is more beautiful than any of that. The loss of individualism that comes with assimilation to the many might be offensive to those who still retain their sense of self. Though, if you were to submit to the will of the many, the feeling and memory of that negative emotion would dissipate very quickly. The audio logs you find in the game describe the positive feeling that comes with their loss of self. They describe it as warm and loving. For some, I imagine it would be like a return to the comfort and security of the mother's womb. There's also the loss of the pain that comes from possessing ego consciousness. The knowledge of our own mortality. 
the burden of lifelong responsibility, all of that would disappear. All that would matter would be the will of the hive mind. Think of those who live with chronic pain or untreated mental illness. I'm sure at least one or two of them would prefer the many's all-encompassing embrace to the pain of individualism. What, what is a drop of rain compared to the storm? What is a thought? What is a thought compared to a mind? Our unity is full of wonder. Is full of wonder which, which your, your tiny individualism, individualism cannot even conceive. I imagine Shodan's utopia would offer something similar. Though she is clearly malevolent, the humans that fell under her manipulation wouldn't be able to tell. If we were mutated and cybernetically enhanced in a way that would bring us under her ultimate control, she could convert every spark of individualism within us into bliss. A dissenting thought would be turned into love. Every pain could turn to pleasure almost instantaneously. Then again, the reality would more likely be a sort of hell, given her perception of humans as insects. The totalizing nature of Shodan's plan towers over the plans of, let's say, the machines from The Matrix. At least in The Matrix, there's the possibility of freeing oneself by taking the red pill. Shodan's plan, however, includes an element that those machines did not have. The faster-than-light drive. FTL technology does more than allow people to travel at a speed faster than light. It involves the manipulation of reality itself through the bending of space-time. Shodan wished to use Delacroix's FTL drive to merge the real world and the cyber world she existed in. Of course, how this would work is as unknown to me as it is to physicists, who generally believe FTL technology to be impossible. After all, any form of matter traveling faster than light would violate the law of causality, and imply the ability to travel through time. Nonetheless, in the reality of System Shock 2, Shodan is able to make digital particles travel faster than light, causing real-world particles to either mix with the digital, or be eliminated entirely. The result is a proto-reality, one that we briefly see a glimpse of towards the end of the game. Unlike the control of the aforementioned Matrix, where reality is purely digital, the reality Shodan wants to create is a mixture of digital and real. The only example of a dictatorial AI whose intentions might be more terrifying than Shodan's are that of Am from the previously mentioned I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. There, the last human alive is turned into a motionless ball of meat, one that can never die but can never truly live either. At least, though, in that state, one would retain their sense of individuality. If we were brought under the control of Shodan or the many, we would lose our individuality. I suppose if you were to choose between one state or the other depends on how much you prize your sense of self. I would like to ask you, the viewer, which outcome you would choose. But before you make your choice, consider the fact that in both System Shock games, it was a single, conscious individual who overcame the omnipresent and omnipotent power of both the many and Shodan. Though both the hacker and the soldier suffered through immense hardship to defeat both, their efforts were met with the praise of all of humanity and the moral and fiscal reward that naturally follows. The glory, the power, that comes from a single individual has the potential to overcome even the most powerful dictator. Even if you were reduced to an inert clump of organic mass, that precious jewel of your individual consciousness would remain, and its existence would forever irritate its digital master. The question is though, would you accept the responsibility of preserving that? If you liked this video, please hit the like button. When you do that, it tells the YouTube algorithm that not only this video, but all the other videos on my channel are worth watching. Those videos then get passed around into people's recommended feeds. Just by doing something as free and simple as hitting the like button helps me greatly, so please do so. Also, if you like the work I am doing here, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put a link to my Patreon in the description box below. Until my next video, 
just remember to stay safe and stay yellow.